Well, my first job in gaming was with a company called Taurus Games, and so I got that after I'd done about two and a half years of an engineering degree. I got this offer from Taurus and thought, well, that's what I want to do. It's not the first start of the story, though. The start of the story is back when I was about 17, I tried to start my own company with a friend, uh, a partnership, and unfortunately that didn't go too far. I never finished my game, and I went back to university to, to study a bit more until I got that first job. Well, Firemint was the company I started. Initially, I had it uh, under a name of N-dimensional software, actually. It was meant to be multi-dimensional software, if you like. And it was a company that, um, that I started when I left uh, Taurus Games. So I, I had a lot of experience at that point and really had always felt the need to, to go out on my own and, and do something, uh, something myself. Uh, we ultimately always wanted to make our own games that is, think up our own idea, make the game and try to sell it to the public. But it requires a lot of financial resources, it requires a lot of experience and understanding that we didn't have when we first started. So for a number of practical reasons, really, we, we went into what you call work for hire business, where you work for the publisher. When the iPhone came out, we realised we could publish directly to the consumer. And it was when we published Flight Control and it became number one, we realised we could not only do it, but we could do it successfully. Uh, so that really changed everything. And over the next year or so, we transitioned the business entirely. That's all 40 odd people transitioned entirely away from an old business model to, to this new model where we're publisher and developer. Flight Control started with uh, my Christmas holidays in end of 2008, so early 2009. I had a week to myself uh, I wanted to make a game, I decided I was going to finish a game because I wanted to try something out on the new iPhone and see how it goes. And uh, yeah, I had, a, had some, uh, well, I guess what was a really good idea actually at the time, but, it's, but I really thought it was, well, here's something I can make really quickly. And I, I made it and when I came back to work, some other people got involved and about three weeks later, uh, we'd submitted it to the App Store. And uh, yeah, it took about a month after that before it came number one. Flight Control was credited with uh, initiating a new genre of line drawing games. It's, uh, the innovation was in uh, controlling something by parthing it with your finger. Uh, rather than perhaps using a joypad or, or defining a, a path by some complicated means. Looking back, it was the right game at the right time for the platform. In addition to that, it was just something really simple. It was something really fresh. It was uh, so easy to learn and yet there was a, a gameplay emergent in the way that people used it. And now we've seen you know, a number of great hits from uh, companies like Rovio and Half Brick and that who've done similar um, similar things, but we were the first to be, be up there. With this high scoring, simple uh, 99 cent game. So we ventured into the racing genre with Real Racing to be released on iPhone in uh, 2009. We started that game well before Flight Control was ever conceived of. Uh, so this was a, a very planned uh, exercise. The reason we went for a racing title, we really felt there was a big gap uh, in the market. We thought, not just in mobile, but across all of racing that we could fill, uh, fill that gap. There's some really interesting technology obviously in mobile and there's even more um, growing today with you look at uh, technology like Apple's AirPlay where Real Racing 2 can be played you know, on, on the big screen, coming from the little screen. So we feel that we've been able to fulfil a lot of those, uh, those gaps. Looking at racing, it just seemed like no one was doing it very well um, on any mobile platform, and we could do a lot more. We knew that from experiences in the past, so we, we jumped in there. So the future of gaming on mobile phones uh, as I see it, is oh, it's pretty bright to start with. I can still see a lot of, um, of growth just in the way mobiles have been going so far. Uh, what I mean is we're really just seeing the tip of the iceberg for mobile gaming. We're seeing 
a lot of devices are now connected. They can get data at any time. They've got rich interfaces that are very easy to use. But there's so much more left to run on that trend. If you look at data, what, what happens when data is free and connectivity is, is um, always available wherever you are? Uh, you know, it's so cheap that you just don't even have to think about it. Then you've got, you're opening up a lot uh, richer sort of social games. Social experiences are already emerging in mobile, but uh, having, um, having access to, to effectively free data is going to change uh, what's possible. When I look at iPad and iPhone, and which I'd prefer to develop for. I do enjoy the iPad simply because we've got a little bit more power there. We've got a slightly larger screen and we're able to do a little bit more. But once they go up on the big screen, for example, by using AirPlay uh, on Real Racing 2, there's no difference there effectively on the, on the big screen. I also, what I love about the iPhone is actually that it is naturally a more connected, a more social device, so we're able to do things there. So if I'm making a, a big, immersive, rich game, I like the iPad. If you're making a, a very simple, very core social game like Flight Control, I actually kind of prefer iPhone. I was fortunate to be awarded uh, an Entrepreneur of the Year award for technology in 2010. It really got me thinking a lot about what an entrepreneur is and that's where I sort of started to realise that all the things we would, that was going into creating a game was much the same as what goes into creating a business and I believe that entrepreneurs create. They create uh, a gap. Now, it's a gap between the resources that you've been given and the outcome that you produce. So you make a a better game, you know, a better game than the sum of its parts, or you make a better result than the individuals on a team by bringing them together. I, I believe that's an entrepreneurial activity. And I saw the same thing with making a hit game as making a hit business. And I, I thought it's, it's all very much the same. It's about a certain, a certain drive and a certain ability to work within the constraints you have to deliver something that's um, great for, for the user. Firemeet now having been purchased by EA is definitely a major. You know, I used to think at some point in time that we very much that we were an indie. I think the distinction for me, and, and the distinction is different for everyone that I've talked to, but I'll, I'll put my line in the sand and say, here's what I think. I, I think uh, an indie, if you look at the business decisions and you look at the creative decisions and the business direction, it's all the same and all with the same person in an indie. So, and I'd say with a, with a major, the big, that's a big difference you'll see is separate business decisions, separate sort of creative decisions. And it's, um, I, I'll, I'll use that definition to say, you know, at some point uh, I started to uh, distance um, myself more from the creative day to day. And it, perhaps, perhaps at that point we started becoming a major. I think the important thing for young people trying to get a start in games is that really the process you've got to go on is about making games. I mean, that sounds really obvious, but it's one thing to go through a university degree that says it will get you there or to, you know, to, to do all your education and that, but you've got to be making games at some point. And unfortunately, I think a lot of the, a lot of the education and a lot of the path that people are taking never see them learn to just finish something simple. And that's a really valuable experience for a lot of, uh, a lot of people who are getting out there. So it's just about get your hands dirty and, uh, and do something and you'll learn more from that than you can from anything else. And when you take something that you've actually done, probably on your own time, of your own volition, to, um, to a studio as your, part of your resume, that really goes a long way. It'll go further than your university degree. The fact that you've, again, taken that entrepreneurial action to create something which I think is what games are all about. And I think it takes an entrepreneurial drive to build one, to finish one, uh, get it out there. So if you can do that on a small scale, tiny scale, don't try and do something big, uh, that will really help immensely. It feels absolutely fantastic to, to be here today because I'm, I'm thinking of this exhibition as just a fantastic uh, sort of cultural uh, event as on its own, in its own right. As a, as a game developer, I've been looking for that sort of recognition for the games industry for so long. 
but to actually be involved and actually be exhibited uh, in this is so much better. <laughs> it's uh, just, yeah, it's a wonderful feeling. I feel really, really honoured to be uh, to be out there and to be talking to people like Lauren Spector and Tim Schaefer and, and he, yes, being in the same space. It's just fantastic. Whenever I talk to someone in a different studio and hear about how they approach things, uh, it's often vastly different. And I think a lot of the, the the leaders in games have vastly different approaches, but vastly different skill sets as well. And I think that speaks to to the breadth of games. I think it covers a very wide swathe of human experience. I know I like to focus on on perhaps the jobs people do, like flight control is an air traffic control uh, simulator. There's something fun in that. Um, others, real racing is a bit of a sport. Uh, others are real experts at, at creating story and getting that into a game and others are about setting and, and feel and it just covers a very broad um, spectrum and so you see a lot of different process, creative processes out there. Uh, so that's really fascinating for me just to see how, how everyone works and you know, learn a few things too because we're all moving forward together in figuring out how best to make games. It's still, it's still a very nascent industry in that sense. So I think there's a real opportunity again for, for up and coming uh, sort of young entrants into the industry to really make a mark and to change something significantly for the entire industry.